I am Dr. Joel A. Rosenfeld of the University of South Florida, and today I would like to talk to you about the incredible occupation kernel. Occupation kernels have become a core part of my research for the past four years or so, and me and my colleagues have twisted and turned them to solve a variety of approximation and system identification tasks. We have used them to decompose certain dynamic operators, which gives us a generalization of some of the results we've seen for dynamic mode decomposition. We have used them to come up with a new algorithm for what is called motion tomography, which allows us to map underwater currents using very simple low-cost gliders. We have used them to define norms and Hilbert spaces on symbols of densely defined operators. And most of the things that we do with them really only require a little bit of knowledge of the Ries theorem and the fundamental theorem of calculus. So today I wanna to talk to you about the genesis of the idea of the occupation kernel a whole bunch of different applications that we found, and we should have some fun with this. So an occupation kernel corresponds to, say, a continuous trajectory in Rn. It resides inside of what is called a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And the occupation kernel itself comes from a representation of a functional within this reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So let's go ahead and get this started. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and draw one right here. So we go up here like this, and we'll come back around like this, and we're going to come in and do a little swirly there. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this and I'm gonna turn this into an occupation kernel. And if we change the reproduced kernel helper space, we're gonna see that the occupation kernel itself changes. So let's go ahead and see how that works. Now we are gonna look at the occupation kernel corresponding to the trajectory we drew just a second ago. And you'll notice that here we are using the Gaussian radial basis function. And as we draw more and more of the trajectory, we see that the regions where the trajectory spends its most time we end up having the highest values of our function. If we go ahead and change the kernel, we get a different occupation kernel. So for instance, if I change from having a very wide kernel to a very thin kernel, we get this. And if I change from the Gaussian RBF to the exponential dot product kernel, it looks completely different. These are all occupation kernels corresponding to the same trajectory in different Hilbert spaces. And this is the central object of our discussion today. And now let's go see the formal definition of the occupation kernel. So a reproducing kernel Hilbert space is a space of functions. And so it maps, say, a set X to the complex plane or the reals. And the idea is that a reproducing kernel Hilbert space has the property that for every x in x, the functional that maps our functions to their evaluation at x is a bounded functional. And so the Ries representation theorem tells us that there is a unique function inside our space, which we'll say is a kernel function centered at x, such that when you take f and you inner product it against that kernel function, that you're gonna get evaluation of that function back. And then you can take these kernel functions centered at various points, and you can combine them through an inner product to make the kernel function. And there is a unique identification between a kernel function and the reproducing kernel Hilbert space it comes from. And this is the aaronstein mohr theorem back in the 1950s. These occupation kernels, they themselves are inside a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, and they represent the functional that is integration along a trajectory after composition with a function from the space. It turns out if your space is say continuous and most reproduced kernel Hilbert spaces are and your trajectory itself is continuous or at least bounded measurable, then that means that this is a bounded functional. And if it's a bounded functional, the Ries representation theorem says that there is a unique function inside of the space that represents that functional through the inner product. Then that is exactly what these occupation kernels are. Now, the nice thing is we can use these two ideas to get a nice representation of these occupation kernels. Before anybody yells at me, I'm just gonna be working over the reals, and so I'm just gonna ignore any sort of conjugation, but it's easy enough to add back in if you want. And so if we want to evaluate our occupation kernel at x, that is the same as taking the inner product of our occupation kernel with a kernel function centered at x. But then if we take that inner product and we swap it around, we can see that that is the same as composing our trajectory into k sub x and then integrating from zero to t. And well, there you go. That is a nice clean representation of our occupation kernel with respect to the kernel function itself. Let's go ahead and take a look and see how occupation kernels can be used to save lives. Or at least it generalizes an idea that already saves lives every day, and that is CT scanners. So now let me tell you about this Nobel Prize winning invention. You might have heard of it. It's called a CT scanner. In 1979, Cormac and Hounsfield got the Nobel Prize for the invention of the CT scanner. And 
that has obviously saved plenty of lives. It helps you see straight inside of a person. So if you've seen all these different movies with different slices of brains and all these other things, those slices allows you to do things like locate a tumor, a bleed, or anything else. Essentially what happens is they're using integrals along a straight line as their data. In particular, if you take a, an x-ray and you shoot it straight through your head, on the other side, you're going to have a receiver. And that receiver is going to see the shadow cast from the x-ray beam through your head. And wherever the shadow is darkest is where we have the most absorption of the x-ray. And the way we quantify this is through the radon transform. So now, if you take a look at this book that was written shortly after the Nobel Prize, and this was written by Stanley Deans, who happened to be a physics professor at the same university I'm at now. So you take a look at chapter three, and this is basic properties of the radon transform is what it's called. The radon transform represents the integration across a function along a line. And we parameterize these lines between a point P and a direction C, and this is written like this. If we are playing fast and loose, and let's be honest, this is a mathematics conference, so of course we're playing fast and loose, we can go ahead and think of f times the delta function as being, say, a dual product in the space of continuous functions. And then we have an integral along all these dual products, and then why don't we go ahead and move that integral across to the delta function itself. And so now we have our function f, and we're taking the dual product with the integral of a delta function. Now, what is this integral against the delta function? Well, it should look very close to an occupation kernel, where we replace the delta function with a kernel function. And we know kernel functions are basically the manifestation of the delta function in a reproducing kernel over space. So there's a direct generalization of this radon transform with respect to these occupation kernels. But what's even more interesting is that we're not actually restricted to just a straight line anymore. So if the Nobel Committee is listening, my schedule is wide open in December. And the reason why I say this is we're gonna take the methods behind computed tomography that led to a Nobel Prize, and we're gonna retool them to give a basis function free system identification method. So here's the setting. We have a dynamical system. X dot is equal to F of X and we don't know what F is. What we do know is a function from Rn to Rn that matches our state dimension. And the only thing we have is that we've observed several trajectories, say gamma one through gamma m. And we're gonna leverage these trajectories in order to give us an approximation of our dynamics. Now, before we can go ahead and start, we have to put a hypothesis on f. Now, typically what hypothesis involves for this sort of problem is some sort of measure of continuity. And this is really common inside of numerical analysis. In our case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna assume f is inside of our reproduced kernel helper space. Now, that isn't always gonna be true, but if we we choose a space as flexible enough, say a space that has a universal approximation property. And that means that we can actually find a representative inside of our reproducible kernel helper space that is within machine precision. So we wouldn't be able to tell the difference between that original function and the one that we picked out from our reproducible kernel helper space. So now we're living inside a reproduced kernel helper space. What we're going to do is we're going to try to find a close representative inside that reproduced kernel helper space that is as good as we can get based on the data that we've seen. How do we do this? Well, we set up a regression problem. And to set up this problem, well, all we need to do is take a look at the fundamental theorem of calculus. So if I take each one of these gamma i's and I take the derivative and I integrate it from zero to t, well, then I just get the difference between gamma at t and gamma at zero. Now we know that gamma dot of t is the same as f of gamma of t. And so we can go ahead and replace this integral by the integral from zero to ti of f of gamma i of t dt. Then if you look closely enough, this is the same as taking our f and looking at its inner product against our occupation kernel corresponding to gamma i. So what we want to do then is we want to find the f that will get as close to the difference between the trajectories at the endpoints through this inner product. And so then what we're going to do is we're going to take that, take their difference, and take the absolute value, square it, and take the sum over all i. And this gives us a loss function that we can optimize over. Now, if we let f run over the entire reproduced kernel Hilbert space, we might get several different solutions. But Wabha, back in the 1960s, had this very clever idea. And they said that if you regularize it by adding lambda times the magnitude of f squared, then that means that in this, for this regularized problem, there is an optimal solution inside the span of the functions inside those inner products. So that means 
means that we can represent f as a linear combination of these occupation kernels. And then this optimization problem simply becomes a problem about finding the optimal weights. So this gives us what we call our occupation kernel regression method. And here's a couple of examples where it actually worked out very well. And I have another video that breaks this down into even more detail if you want to check it out on my channel. Now let's see how we can use this in a sort of real world problem. And this is the problem of motion tomography, which is all about mapping underwater currents. So now what I'd like to talk about is the problem of motion tomography. This is where you have a whole bunch of low-class gliders, which are small submarines, that you put into the ocean and you would like them to map ocean currents. Now, let's think of this as a uh, submarine, why don't we? It has a propeller that can give a constant force, so we know roughly how fast it should be going in still water, and it can keep a bearing, so we know what direction it should be going in. But when we put it underwater and when it goes under, we lose contact with it, and we receive no information from it until it comes back out of the water. And so what we'll see is that it actually ends up being in a different place than what we expected. Now that displacement from where we expected it to be when it had the constant speed and the constant direction and the new location can actually be shown to be an integral of the force field generated by the ocean currents. And so this gives us a sort of tomographic sample. But there is one problem that makes it different than what we saw with the dynamical systems. And in this case, what we see is that we don't actually know what the path of the true trajectory was. So this becomes a sort of two-pronged effort in order to get an approximation out of this. We want to get the approximation of the flow field, but we can't get a good approximation of the flow field using the occupation kernel method unless we know what the actual trajectory was. So we need to set up this sort of iteration scheme where we start with a zero flow field and we use those trajectories for our occupation kernels. And then we hope that it isn't too different from what the actual trajectories were, and then we get an approximation for what we think the flow field should be. Then we're going to try to make a new guess of where our trajectory should be using the last approximation of the flow field, which gives us a new approximation, and then we can feed that back in to get new expected trajectories. And we do this over and over again. And we stop when we see that the expected trajectory endpoints match the actual trajectory endpoints, which is actually the only data that we really have. And so this is the motion tomography problem. Demonstrating that you get convergence with this routine comes down to a fixed point iteration method. Now this algorithm, which we published in the Journal of Computational Dynamics, ends up working really well. We actually recruited one of the designers of the original method to come in and help us do a lot of comparisons. And they also provide us with access to the data from Gliderpalooza 2013, where they actually put out a whole bunch of gliders to, act, to give this method a try. And we found that our method was effective there as well. Okay, so that's tomography and, and approximation methods. But what happens when you work in some operators in here? So now let's talk about a parameter identification problem. This is where we have a dynamical system, say x dot is equal to f, and we don't know f. But we do know a collection of basis functions that should be able to approximate f. And so, the idea is that we just wanted to determine what the weights on these basis functions need to be in order to get f back. Now, this is conceptually easier than what we were looking at before, where we had a system identification problem that we resolved through using occupation kernels in a regression framework. Now, in this case, we just need to determine the parameters. What a lot of people do, and this is really a misstep in my opinion, is that they actually take numerical derivatives of your trajectories. So you're given some sort of collection of trajectories and you'd like to use them in a linear algebra framework in order to figure out the parameters. But when you take numerical derivatives, you amplify any noise that you have in your system. So any signal noise that you had coming in becomes huge and you really want to get around that. And so if you've done a numerical derivative in order to resolve a parameter identification problem or any sort of system identification problem, you've already taken the wrong step. So how do we get around this? Well, we're gonna use the fundamental theorem of calculus again. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take observables. So what we do is we take an observable, which is a function in a reproducible kernel Hilbert space, and then we go ahead and we take its gradient and we multiply by what the dynamics are. Now remember, we don't know what the dynamics are, but we do know the parameterization. So on one hand, we know that if we compose that product with a trajectory from the system and then integrate from zero to t, well, f of that trajectory should just be the time derivative of that trajectory. And so then you just get a sort of time derivative of 
your observable composed with the trajectory. And so fundamental theorem of calculus comes in and saves the day and you get that the result is your observable evaluated at one endpoint of the trajectory minus the observable evaluated at the other end of the trajectory. And now let's take a look and see what happens when we expand f in terms of its parameters. Since we know all these basis functions, we can take a look at the gradient of g times each one of these basis functions, each of these yi's, and we can go ahead and compose the trajectory in. Now this time we're not gonna use fundamental theorem of calculus because y itself isn't the dynamics for our trajectory. But we do know why because is an a priori assumption. So we can just go ahead and integrate that. And we can do that for each one of our basis functions. And what this does for this one particular trajectory is that it gives us constraints on the weights. And then if you add more and more trajectories, you can set up a whole system of equations that you need to solve. And the weights that resolve these trajectories are the parameters for our system. Now, this is fairly elementary and it wouldn't really be worth mentioning in this operator theory context without a little bit of extra stuff. So now we're gonna tell you how we can turn this into a projection problem for a Hilbert space that we generate from the data itself. Okay, so here's how we do it. It turns out that if you take one, each one of these Liouville operators, that the occupation kernel corresponding to a continuous trajectory is automatically inside the domain of the adjoint of every Liouville operator. Then if we look at f in a Liouville operator and each one of these yi's being a Liouville operator, and now we actually see that each of these Liouville operators are actually linear with respect to their symbols. And so this allows us to make a new kind of inner product. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the collection of all symbols for densely defined operators and we'll call this curly f. If you take two elements from curly f, say f1 and f2, then you can define an inner product on them like this. So what you do is you take the inner product of the adjoint of the Liouville operator corresponding to F2 against the occupation kernel with the adjoint of the Liouville operator corresponding to F1 against the occupation kernel. And this is an inner product in our curly F space of F1 and F2. And so now once we have an inner product, we can take a look at the quotient space and we can complete it. And then that ends up giving us a Hilbert space. And now if we go back and we look at the parameter identification problem and we reframe this as a regression problem where we are talking about the norm in terms of this curly F space, then this minimization problem really just gives you the projection of F onto the span of these YIs. Now, if we go ahead and we expand this inner product and we take the derivative with respect to the weights and set that equal to zero, then you end up getting this linear system. But we can factor these matrices. And when we factor these matrices, we can see that we have this sort of matrix that is on the left side of each of these equations. And so if we go ahead and scrub that out, we see that what is left over is actually a parameter identification routine in the first setting that we had before. But our basis functions are now coming from the features of the kernel function itself. And so then we see that this really basic parameter identification routine that we did in the very beginning ends up leading to a process that will allow us to get weights that will realize the projection inside of our new Hilbert space. And this Hilbert space is completely data-driven and it comes from the trajectory that we've actually observed. And if you wanna see more on that, you can see that parameter identification stuff on my YouTube channel. And now I'd really love to get into talking about dynamic mode decompositions, but unfortunately I think we're running out of time. And so I actually have an entire playlist on my YouTube channel dedicated to DMD and all the neat tricks that you can do with operators and the sort of system identification framework. So thank you for watching. And if you have any questions, well, I'm here to answer them.